Hey everyone. Um, my name is Krasimir Zone. For uh, my colleagues called me Krasimir. I'm, I'm Bulgarian. It's actually Krasimir. Um, yesterday morning I woke up and I realized that I, I had no voice. So if I, in the middle of the talk, if I just start talking like this, you know why. I also make like, <coughs> not to kind of bring your attention, but just because I'm kind of sick, uh, just to know. So my topic today is um, state machines. I work for a company called Antidote. Uh, we are helping people reach in clinical trials. The things which I'm doing there is mostly uh, single-page apps, progressive web apps. I'm writing mostly in React and uh, with Redux and all the fancy stuff. Um, I'll, st I'll start with a simple example. Um, some piece of UI, uh, think about this as a component that you uh, have to place on your page. Uh, should be kind of uh, self-organized, should be like a box you just throw away somewhere and it works. Uh, it's a username, uh, it, it's a form with a username and password, and you submit the form, you ask the backend for something, and you expect some, uh, some response. Um, so this UI has another, another state as well, and that's when uh, you log in successfully. We should display this um, short welcome message and these two links. If you click the first one, something else on the page changes. If you click the second one, you, you have to log out which means brings back to the first screen and uh, probably fire a request to the backend, so you kill the session and so on. So uh, how to manage the state of this component? Um, let's say that we have this uh, boolean, uh, which is like is logged in. Uh, in fact, this, this is probably just a user object, and when you fetch the data from the backend, you just assign something to this object and later you just check if this object is no, if it's not no, then you're in the second screen. But in, at the end, it's just, it's just a single variable. So we have these two states, and we use a single variable to control the state of this, uh, of this component. But then when you release this, you realize that you actually need a third screen. And that's when you make the request to the backend. Uh, because the process is asynchronous, it's not happening immediately, so there is some like two seconds delay between the first screen and the second one, and you can't leave the user on the first screen because the user may click the submit button again or start uh, breaking our uh, component. So we have a single variable, which is not false, but it's not true. So uh, thankfully in programming, there is no such a term like falseish or something between zero or one. So we have to come with another solution. So we just come up with another variable. So let's say that we have a user object and this variable is in progress. When we fire the request to the backend, we set the, uh, the variable to true. And uh, when the request is finished and we get the result, um, we turn it back to false. So that's nice, but... Uh, one day, the project manager comes to you and, and, and asks, you know what? We want to display something when the user is logged in successfully. So this will be a screen which we display for two seconds, and uh, we just fade out to the other one with the welcome message. And then it gets really interesting how you control the state. Because we have this user object, this is logged in flag, and you think, OK, this flag is true uh, in these two screens. Uh, is in progress is false. So can we say that when is, is, is in progress is false and is logged in is true, then we display the screen. So even now when I'm saying this, it sounds a little bit complicated, right? And if you see this if statement where you check, oh, is this true, is this false, you kind of make this dependency between these two variables. So uh, even though it works, it, it looks a little bit weird. And over the time, when you start adding more and more features, you probably end up having a bunch of these if statements in your uh, components or states or store or reducer or whatever. Um, and uh, to, to kind of solve this situation, we, we say, OK, let's, 
let's just come with uh, sorry. Let's just come with another variable, which is is successful. So we have a single explicit variable which is uh, there just for the screen. And when the user is logged in successfully, we just set it to true and we show this animation. We fade out to so the other screen. Problem solved. But then you realize that sometimes the backend is broken, and then you need this this uh, fifth screen. And now it gets even more complicated because you can't use is successful because is successful is false by default. So if you rely on it to display another screen, you actually fail because it's false. It's uh, when I define it, it's, it's actually false, and I'll, I'll probably show this screen error screen. Um, so we may have different types of errors, like this one, for example, is an error when there is no connection. Because in this case, uh, by the way, this is a real, real use case. We had this situation in, uh, in one of our apps. Uh, so we said, you know what? When uh, I fire the request to the backend, the request fails, uh, or actually times out, I know that uh, it's not the backend telling us uh, the conditions are, are wrong, for example. It's because there is no connection, bless you, uh, there is no connection to the backend. So uh, we know, in this case, we have the credentials. We have the information, the username and password. We don't want to bring back the user to the, uh, to the initial screen because we have this information. So we decided, OK, let's just provide the try again. Uh, the message would be probably something like, yeah, you, you don't have internet right now. I'll try again later. But uh, in the real case, um, in the real case scenario, we actually had a couple of other errors which are like wrong password, for example, um, wrong user role, or something like this. And we had a couple of different error screens. And one of them was when you type a wrong username and password, you have to bring back the user to the first screen, but actually display a message below it. And now, it, it, it sounds like we have a bunch of UI with different states, and we have this, like, uh, how many? Four variables. And it gets really messy, really buggy, and we didn't know what to do. So uh, this was actually the elephant in the room, which we never talk about. And I'm pretty sure that you have in your apps, you have such cases where um, you're controlling a piece of UI uh, using a variable, for example, or, or a flag. Or, or maybe it's not a single variable, but you rely on objects, uh, whether they are defined or not, or maybe array which is empty and you display something if it's empty and you display something else if it's not empty, or if it has only one item or something like this. So all these states, they're actually managed usually with something like flags. And this is actually the problem. This is the problem of state management. And if we start asking ourselves what, what's a state, state is actually a variable which we change over time. Every time when we define a variable, not a constant, a variable, even in a, in, in a single function and we change the value of this variable, we are actually um, managing state. And uh, what's then a data management or data flow management? Data flow management is uh, the processes which we apply in order to change the value of the variable. Uh, while the state management is something completely different. And I'm pretty sure that uh, the, the data management answers actually on the question how we change, change the data. All the processes, like for example, Redux. Uh, by the way, how many of you use React, write React applications with Redux maybe? Yeah, I guess. So when you use Redux, we have this really nice concepts there, but uh, at the end, I could mess up the application because we did it. Uh, we are using Redux, and um, we ended up having these variables. So our state management was actually the weak part of this component, because we didn't actually do a state management. Redux provides us really nice um, instruments for data fold management. Even in the official documentation of Redux, for example, um, they say Redux is a, a flexible state container or a predictable state container. This is the very first sentence. So Redux is not about state management. It's about data flow management. And it, it keeps your state in a really nice way. The, this idea is about immutability and 
uh, the idea of having a reducer and stuff, they're, they're really awesome. And it works really well, but that's not a state management. Because uh, Redux answers on a question how we actually change the values of, uh, of these variables. While the state management is a thing that answers on the question why, why we, why we change it. And I think you know that in the front end development, especially developing UI, the most difficult thing is actually managing state. This is clear for, for years. If you, uh, if you ask some developer which works with UI in every environment, he uh, probably or she will answer that the most difficult thing in UI is actually state management. So state management is different from data and data full management. And now I want to show you how I was approaching the state management last maybe 11 years or so. So I started writing JavaScript in 2006. Uh, it was mostly, well, at, at this time I was doing most of um, Flash applications using ActionScript, which is really close to JavaScript because it's ECMAScript based. Uh, there were qu classes and uh, two frameworks, which are like MVC frameworks and stuff. So uh, when I started writing JavaScript, it was like really all, all the stuff were in, in the global space. So there was no state management. There was no data management at all. Uh, then 2008, uh, I started using jQuery. It's again really nice tool solving lots of different issues, but it's not solving the state management. It's not solving even the data management. It's just fixing some issues with the browsers and stuff. Uh, then uh, this really nice small library, I, I don't even call it a framework uh, because it's, yeah, it's more like a library. Backbone um, had this uh, model and the view. We had this uh, when you dispatch this action, the model uh, kind of synchronizes with the backend by itself. It was really small. You could just read the code to understand what it's doing. And um, it, was, it was a really nice library. But it was kind of making some progress in a data fold management. It wasn't about state management. Then, these two years, I, I didn't use these frameworks in production. I just started reading about them. Um, they come with uh, kind of some ideas about state management, but at the end, it's, it's the same, actually. They, they provide very really nice tools to manage the data in your app, to manage the user input, uh, to handle events from everywhere, to deal with, uh, with side effects and stuff. But it's not a tool that help you solve the help you answer the why question. And by the way, the state management is really difficult because it's uh, it's really app specific. Every app has different state management problems. That's why it's difficult to find a library or or a framework which solves uh, what your use case. Then 2014, uh, I started working for this company Antidote, and we started using Reactive, which uh, it's a nice framework, but it, it's purely a view layer. With uh, it, it's really kind of close to React. It, it provides some data fold management with events, and uh, you could share state between components. That was actually the first time when I started uh, building apps with components. So, uh, but there is no state management still. Then 2015, we migrated all the, our products to React and started using Flux. So uh, people are actually thinking about Flux and, and Redux as a tool for state management. So Redux is a predictable state container. It's not for state management. Flux is, uh, I would say, again, predictable architecture for building UI. That, that's how it, it is defined by, by Facebook, because it comes with really nice concepts like one data uh, one-way data flow, uh, again, like these things with immutability and stuff, it's really nice. It makes your app predictable, but it's not about state management. And then the, the year after that, we migrated to Redux. So the current state of our stack is uh, React and Redux. And even though we focus a lot on state management, we again ended up having uh, this the same problem, which I described in the beginning. We were developing this small UI. It was a small component. And we had this, like, OK, if uh, we, we put some thinking in it, 
it, it wasn't done with four variables. It's just two variables and one object. And we, we kind of spend a lot of time just to make the state management clear for the newcomers. Uh, but at the end, it, we again had this like, if statements everywhere because we didn't define the state really clearly because it, it's these three things and they depend on each other. So even today, I see how uh, the front-end development is answering more on a question how we actually manage our data, how we pass messages from this place to this place, how we mutate the state, uh, but it's not answering the question why, and it's not helping answering this question. So then, a month ago, I realized that there is actually no state management at all. We didn't use... Uh, any tool for state management. It was purely done with stuff which are helping really writing less code and it's readable and stuff, but it was just about data. It was about how the data falls in our app and how we handle the user uh, input and stuff. So then I found the concept about state machines. And um, honestly, after the generators in JavaScript, this was the second time when I was just like completely sold. I, I started reading about state machines uh, from Wikipedia. I don't know why. I was searching for something. And then this really hits me. And uh, when I started searching for applying state machine in, in, in front-end development, uh, I realized that we are actually writing state machines every day. Even, even you're writing state machines every day. You just don't know it. And, you're, we are re-implementing these machines again and again, over and over, without using a tool for this. So what's a state machine? The state machine is um, the official uh, description about state machine is that it's a, uh, a module for computation. But the, my explanation is that the state machine has different states, uh, could uh, actually stores your state, similar to like Redux, keeps your state in one place and could be in one case at a given time. It can, it can satisfy two states at the same time. It's always just in one state. So uh, the other characteristic of the state machine is that, is that accepts input. And the input in, in UI, uh, in, in front end, is usually the user input but could be, I don't know, a uh, response from a backend service or something. So we get the input, we have the state, and then the machine transitions to another state. When, we change the sta uh, when the machine changes its state, we, we say that it's now transitioned to, to a new state. Um, so the, the decision about, about what states um, to be is taken by the machine based on the input and based on the current state. And it may produce or may not some output. It depends. But always, uh, well, it could stay in the same state, if that makes sense to you. But it's, uh, that's, that's the rule. You have input. You have current state. You define the rules, and the machine decides, yeah, I'm seeing this input now. I'm in this state. So now I'll transition to this state. So uh, the easiest uh, thing that I may use to explain what state machine is, is, is to use the turnstile. So the turnstile could be in two, in, in two states. We have two, uh, two states, walked and unwalked. So when we are in a walked state, we accept two inputs, push, and we may like, put a con inside. So when we are pushing, when it's walked, it's walked. You can transition to another state, right? While if you give another input to the coin, machine knows that knows the rules, and it transitions to unwalk state. And then when you're in an unwalk state, if you push again, you go into a walk state because you're just passing through. Uh, if, you, if it's already unwalked and you put another coin, you know, you, you, you're just losing money. It's, it's not transitioning to, to another state. So uh, the state machines usually are described with such graphs. Uh, but I like to show them in, in tables. So uh, there could be one column, which is the output, but 
yeah, I just uh, used three. So we have a state worked. We have these two inputs, and we have the states, uh, the new states. If it's unworked, you will say push and coin, and we transition to another state. So if you go back to our previous example, uh, how we actually solve this thing with using state machine. Well, I sit one day, and knowing all this stuff about state machines, about uh, the fact that I'm getting input, um, I have like number of states. Actually, the thing which I described uh, is a state machine, is a finite state machine, which means that we have a finite number of states. There could be infinite state machine, which I believe doesn't make a lot of sense in, in uh, front-end development, because we, uh, we have a finite states. We know all the states of our apps. Um, and the finite state machine, they become like two other types, but yeah, these are maybe just... Uh, that's enough. Um, so how we could transition this mess to uh, an application using a state machine? So I started by creating this table. Uh, and so I started defining my states and answering two simple questions. The first one is, what are the states of my app? So uh, this is really important question, I think, because in the beginning when we started developing this widget, uh, this component, we didn't. <coughs> sorry, um, we didn't ask this question, and we ended up having more and more states over the time because we didn't clearly define in the beginning what what's happening. The second question is: If I am in this state, what's the possible input? So when I'm in a long inform state, I accept only one thing: the user may just click the button. I don't accept like error or success or anything else. It's just the submit uh, the submit uh, input. And later we will call this action. So uh, if this happens, then we transition to the loading, uh, loading state. So when we're in a loading state, the two things that may happen is that we either get success of the request or uh, we get a failure. So. Uh, even in this case, just seeing this table, just seeing these two states, we see uh, how we uh, solve one of the bugs. Uh, and that was uh, the user can click the submit button again and again. Because if the user clicks the button once, we transition to loading state. And the loading state is not accepting submit action. It's just success and failure. So the machine, the, the machine just ignores this, and it's, it's doing nothing. So if you accept the uh, success input, then we transition to profile, where we could see this view profile link and the logout. The logout leads to login form, for example. If for some reason our app makes two requests to the backend for like authentication, well, you know that it's it's really difficult to when you run a promise, and the promise is in flight, like the request is in flight, you're waiting for response. You have a promise, and then for some reason, I don't know, a book or something, you fire the same thing twice. And then you don't want to leave the first one, you just want to handle the second one. And there are a couple of libraries which are helping uh, in this case, uh, but in, by spec, it's it's not possible to stop the promise, right? Or, or stop the, the request. You've already fired it. So in this case, if you have two requests in flight, and the first one, um, for example, returns a success, then we just transition to a profile. And the second one, at some point, for example, says, ah, sorry, error. But in a profile state, we are not accepting the failure action. So the app is doing nothing. It's just ignoring this. And this doesn't make sense at this point when we are at the profile, because we are already logged in. So uh, and the last one, the error state, when uh, we have this screen, you could click try again, you go back to loading, and the whole loop is repeating again. So uh, I noticed that the state machines are actually doing uh, more than just solving bugs. They make sure that our app is only in states which we know about, 
because we define them in the beginning. If I, if I create such a table for my app, I know that, yeah, these are all my possible states. These are all my possible inputs. If something happens which is not in this table, the machine is not responding. It's just ignoring it. And this is the first thing. It, uh, it, it, it protects us uh, from being in a state which you don't know about or it's a wrong state. When we are making the request and we are in a loading screen, we don't want to see the errors, right? So that's not possible because the machine is not accepting uh, profile action, for example, when we are loading. So um, I took this table and started playing with it. And we realized that the thing that we did is that we implemented a state machine using Redux. And it was done by defining, uh, for example, an, an object which had this, uh, all the keys of the objects uh, of the object were um, the states. And this object, they, uh, they had um, keys, which are the actions, just implementation details. But uh, in the end, it was really clear. You just look at this object and you see this table. And we didn't have to think about like having if statements and, and, and stuff. I, even, for example, is in progress variable from the beginning is just gone. It, we don't have such a variable because we know that the loading screen actually represents the loading state, and that's it. So now I'm going to show you a library which uh, uh, I started using in. Well, it's it's kind of a small project, not at work, because it's not battle tested, and I can just ship it in production without yeah knowing that it works. So uh, when I started doing this, um, I, I had two goals. The first one is like to have a tool which helps me use state machines in JavaScript, and the other one was to solve a couple of problem of uh, problems of Redux. Uh, because there's stuff which really bugs me there, and I'm I'm pretty happy with Redux. Uh, it's it's a really nice piece of software. It's uh, it it comes with really nice ideas. It's, it teaches really awesome stuff. Uh, but first, when we are using Redux, we have to define a bunch of a bunch of actions. Uh, you define constants for these actions. You define action creators which are using the constants, and then you import this actions in your app. So if you have a big React app, which lots of actions, you know how many action creators you have, how you have to import them in different places. So it's it, it, it kind of bothered which, which you can't escape from. Um, and the other problem was that Redux, uh, even though it's possible to implement a state machine, even the, if, if you think a little bit, uh, the I believe the most famous feature of Redux is the idea of having a reducer, which is a function which accepts your state, like the current state of your app, and an action. And you always have to return a new version of this state in an immutable fashion. So if you think a little, about, a little bit about the reducer, you see that this itself is an actual state machine, because you have this input. Um, from the user, the action payload, for example, you have the current state, and based on the input and the current state, you decide what to be the next state. So this is actually a state machine. But the thing is that even though this is clear, we, we don't have this protection, which is about, if you receive this action, please do nothing, because I'm in this state. So, so this, to satisfy this, uh, this thing, you have to write lots of lots of conditional logic, like saying if, for example, if if is in progress is true, yeah, don't accept the submit action. Or I you have a reducer which is accepting the submit uh, action, and you say, oh, I'm in progress. I'll just return the same state because I want my app to be in the same state, right? And you write this if statements everywhere. Uh, so your code actually becomes. Um, indeed, this is a state machine. You you implemented it, but it's it's kind of hidden be behind all this code, and it's it's difficult to work with it because you, you start getting more and more cases that you have to satisfy, and sooner or later you you just like gave up and yeah, let's rewrite this in Vue or Angular or maybe thinking that this will solve the problem. But the the, the actual problem is that the state management is is, is something that. 
it's difficult and uh, it's difficult to find it, to, to make it right and to make it scalable. So I started doing this uh, library, which I call, I call it Stand. There is a story behind the name. Uh, the API of the library is really close to, um, to Redux. There are some really, most of the ideas are taken from there. And my goal with this is to someday to just replace Redux with it. So it's available as an NPM module. Um, the concept about state in, in, in this library is uh, having an object and the only one reserved property is name. Everything else could be, it depends of what state you are. Like if we are in a loading state, for example, we just got the credentials from the form. So we just say, yeah, my state is now has a name loading and I'm just keeping this data because I need it. Um, yeah, everything else could be just some data. So how do you define uh, a state machine? Uh, this API is actually the same in, in the other libraries. I'll, I'll mention them at the end, or I'll just mention them now. Um, one of them is uh, X state. The other one is Machina or Machina JS. I don't know how to pronounce it. But they both have actually the same uh, API. You start with, uh, yeah, maybe a little bit different, but you, you start with initial state. You have your transitions, which are defined in the form of here are my states, here is the input, here is a handler which is, transition, which is actually making the transition. So um, the handler. The handler in, the, in this library could be just a string, which is the same as the second line. Uh, it's just converting to, to an object, having the name property equal to the string. Could be a function, which is the same as the Redux reducer. Um, and at the end, the thing which we saw in the previous talk, uh, using a generator, so that was maybe the last year. For me, this is like the biggest thing that happened in JavaScript. The, I started using generators. Do you use Redux Saga, someone? Yeah, awesome. So the Saga pattern is actually a really good implementation of the command pattern, which is about um, your saying to someone, please do this thing to me and return the result. So you're splitting the execution of the code or the real work from the code which is uh, defining what the work should be. Or this thing should be done, but you're not doing it there, you're doing it outside. And because in JavaScript pre pre previously, uh, to implement this pattern, uh, yeah, callbacks and stuff, but now with, uh, with the generator, it's, it's really nice because you could pause this function and do something. Like here, for example, in this, uh, in this four lines, five lines at the end, uh, what the generator is doing is changing the state a couple of times in a single function. And it's calling this asynchronous operation. And then it's changing the state again. So this is the same as in, in Redux Saga. And even though Redux Saga is a really nice uh, thing, it's kind of uh, bound to Redux. So it's not, again, about state management. It's, it's about handling the side effects, which are making a uh, request to the backend or something which is asynchronous. So this could be all the, cases, all, all the types of handlers that we have uh, in, in stand. Uh, and here is a simple state machine. So we have um, a state machine with two states, A and B, and A state accepts foo and bar as input, and B state accepts zar as input. And we see that if we run foo and bar, it works, because there are actions which are available for the current state, while zar is not available in the A state, and the machine is, is just like ignoring it. it. It's not doing anything. So this is how the, the machine works. We define our rules, and we just run it, and we dispatch actions. And the machine is the frame, which is saying, oh, this could happen, this, this cannot happen, because I have some rules. So if you think a little bit about this, 
if you don't have functions and we have just strings, this is purely just a static JSON. And because it's JSON, uh, there could be a lot of interesting things uh, with it. Because we could define a really awesome integration test. We could write a script which goes through this JSON and runs all these actions and make sure that uh, you don't have a state which is not visited, you don't have a state which is, uh, you are not firing an action in a wrong state, for example, or make sure that you, um, make sure that your app is capable of covering all the user journeys, for example, in your app. I'm not talking about uh, even the, vi the visual stuff that we could do with, uh, with the code if you were state machines. If, if they're not using functions, because the functions, the problem of using uh, functions as handlers or generators is the fact that in order to see what's the next state, you have to execute the function. And this takes time, it's, it's, it's a little bit uh, different, uh, difficult. So, uh, yeah, this comes uh, after when I started digging into the state machine. I noticed that yeah, some other people in Twitter and stuff, they are uh, making some progress. So, here, was, he, here is our table. So let's see really quick how our handlers looks like for, for this widget, for this component. Um, Probably this is probably the most interesting one. Um, we have the login form state. We use a generator because we have to switch states multiple times, and we have to handle the side effect, which is running this uh, AJAX request somewhere. So we say, um, yeah, now I'm upset. Now I'm accepting the submit action. So I'll now I'll now transition to a loading state. So at this moment. I'm not accepting the submit anymore. And because I'm making this change, we see in a bit, the machine is wired to React, for example. And every time when we change the state of the machine, uh, we re-render. And because we re-render, we have access to the machine, and we could see, oh, now the machine is in a loading state. So I could just show the, the loading screen. Uh, then we wrap the... Uh, the request to the backend in a try catch box, we, we could handle the failure. And if everything is okay, we say, yeah, I have to click when I'm talking. Uh, so if everything is okay, we say, yeah, this success. Ah, that's something else which I, 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 I forgot to mention. So this library actually defines methods which are part of the machine. So the object that we see returned from machine.create has uh, lots of methods, and these methods are actually based on our actions. So once we define our transitions with the states and the actions, the library creates these methods. So this is the same as the action creators, but uh, you don't have to do it by yourself. It's already there. So by saying this dot success, we're just dispatching the success input. And because we're in a loading state, we accept this section. Uh, if, if there is an error, we call the failure. So the second state, loading. Uh, we accept the current state of the app. Uh, we accept the user uh, from the backend. And we transition to a profile. So this, this is just a function. It's not a generator. Um, if we f have the failure, now, now we have to keep something else in our state. We have to keep the username and password because we have to handle this try again thing. And this is something else which comes for free uh, when you're using a library work, this one. I believe it's the same in the other, in, in Machina.js, for example, as well. Uh, you keep in the state of your app only stuff that you need at a given time. Because if I have to keep the username and passwords uh, always, like I see in the code, oh, I have this store and I have a username and password. Ah, it's okay, but once the user log in, you don't need these variables, right? They're, they're, they're in the store because you had a case which needs them. But once you log in, you don't need them. And this is uh, one of the side effects of the, um, of the library. Every time when you're updating the state, you're actually setting 
the stake to something that mean that have meaning right now. Uh, the error is the generator. Um, here I'm doing something tricky. It could be done in a really easy way if you just extract the submit handler. In order to um, to fire the submit action, we have to transition to a loading state, uh, to the to the loading form state. Because we are now, for example, in a loading state, we don't accept the submit. We can't say the submit because it, it will be ignored by the machine. So we transition to login form first, and we then call the submit action. Um, and the profile also is pretty simple. We have uh, here two other actions. OK, so uh, this is the way of how we mount uh, the state machine to, to React. We had the same connect function. If you use Redux, you know that you, ha you, you need this function where you're saying, OK, if my store uh, updates to another state, just re-render this, uh, this component. Um, and yeah, here is the same. We just say, I need this and this machine, because when we create the machines, we give them a name. And we just get these machines, and we could do this uh, map uh, dispatch to props, or map state to props, same as in, in Redux. Um, which is, which is by the way, really nice because we could send everything to the component. We could say the uh, we could send the submit action, for example, as a prop to the component. We just fire it, and the machine receives an input. Okay, um, so this is an example of uh, of mounting, actually. Um, here, yeah, here I'm I'm showing this. Uh, exactly this thing. We're just mounting uh, some characteristic of the machine to props of the component, and we could just use them. Um, it's possible to add middlewares, even though I found out that this is something like an anti-pattern and should be avoided. I mean, you could listen for different actions in, in the machine. Uh, like, for example, when the state changes or before the state change, when an action is dispatched or something. But this should be used only for logging and stuff, because this is kind of breaking what the machine is doing. If, if you start doing some stuff in these handlers, you're basically saying, uh, ignoring the rules defined in the machine, and you're doing something else. But it's, it's still an option. So this is the last slide of my presentation. Uh, you could follow me on Twitter. This is the the link of, of the slides. Uh, there is a link for feedback at the end. I strongly recommend, if you are interested about state machine, to check this library X state and this guy David. He had a really nice talk at uh, React Rally, I think, conference about state machines. Uh, he's doing more deep, uh, more deep. Uh, like learning in state machines. Uh, he's interested in combining state machines to state charts. So it's, uh, yeah, really, really nice stuff if you are uh, sold out into the idea of state machines. And the probably the biggest one, Machina.js. The problem of Machina.js is that it, it, it's really uh, an, an API for defining state machines, but you don't have this Redux-like uh, reducers, for example. Um, there is no way to, well, there is a way, but it's, it's not part of the library to connect it to React, for example. Um, yeah, I hope you didn't fall asleep. <laughs> if you have any questions, I have, we have, do we have time? Maybe not, I don't know. Yeah, that's it then. Thank you.